Hey, it's Tim, Pickup Truck Plus SUV Talk, and I'm excited to share some exclusive details today with Jim Dunmar's engineer. I'll go ahead and let him introduce himself. You are Kevin. I am Kevin Luchansky, Assistant Chief Engineer for the 2.7 liter, kind of all things 2.7 liter. Um, yeah, nice nice oh. to uh, get welcomed here. Thank you. Yeah, I, I was practicing that. I think I was close. All right. Uh, and Kevin is a fan of the channel, which I do appreciate. Um, he does not binge watch me. Thank you very much. But he does watch me in a 55-inch TV. By the way, I did trim my nose here this morning, so we are all good with that because that makes me nervous. But I thought let's hop in. The, I have a set of section questions over because I want to discuss some things happening on the channel. It can pull the time. And if you haven't been in the market for many years, you may be going, my goodness, you know, why are we doing all this stuff? So it's kind of a 30,000 per foot view of what's going on in the marketplace. And uh, why are things changing? And so I want to I want to begin with this. We had done the Chevy Colorado drive last week. And the biggest news from that drive was, hey, Kevin's 2.7 liter. Haha, <laughs> that's why he's here. All right. So the, the, the first question I have for him was, why is GM using a small displacement turbo engine in a truck anyways? It's a big topic. Wouldn't a V6 be better reliability with its simpler design, right? So the, the turbocharged small displacement engines, a little more complex. Um, it seems like there's some conversation about higher compression, all kinds of stuff going on. But I'm just kind of so. So why are we even doing that? Would be the first question. Yeah, it's it's actually it's a great question. Um, I would argue that it's not more complicated, maybe just a little different. Um, but I think the the real reason is efficiency, um, lower mass, better emissions as well. So those are two things that are probably uh, you know emissions and and fuel economy and those things are not as exciting to the regular customer, but what is really as exciting is the performance of the engines. Um, and I got some slides, I don't know as if those are coming through yet, but I got some slides to walk uh, your, your team go. through that, so. Boom, yeah. okay. you know, that, look how tech savvy I am in Nebraska. <laughs> I like your software. It's good. So, all right. Um, so with the outgoing Colorado, uh, we got really strong feedback that folks love that diesel. The 2.8 liter diesel that's in that uh, application just has great low end torque. You can see that here. This is a graph of torque in Newton meters uh, versus engine speed. And you can see how much more torque the diesel makes than the V6. So the 3.6 liter V6 in that application does really good from a power perspective. So um, the, the feedback is, could you put uh, an engine together that makes the same torque um, and, and the same power uh, in one engine? Because uh, that would, would be awesome, right? This, this engine rock climbs really well. It's awesome off, off road, um, but it does run out of wind, um, you know, as you're starting to go off and do things like Baja or even up on the highway, you know, trying to pass people at higher speeds, it starts to run out of wind. So um, that's what the 2.7 can offer. So this is a plot, same plot um, with the 2.7 over top. And you can see um, it makes very similar torque down low, um, basically almost line on line with the diesel, but then it just keeps going. Um, so more torque than the diesel and um, a little more horsepower, um, but it makes more horsepower in the usable range than the V6, right? The V6, you really have to wind it out. Its peak power is out at um, 6,800. And the peak power on the 2.7 is at 5,600. So, um, you know, a little bit more than 1,000 RPM less. It's, it's really tuned for where you drive the engine um, and where people spend all their, all their time in the vehicle. Um, one other thing to, to note is at 3,000 RPM, which is where you spend a lot of time, if you, you know, you look at your TAC, um, the, the 2.7 makes 75% more torque than the V6. So, you just can't do that. Uh, there's no replacement for displacement, right? You need a big engine um, to make this kind of torque or a turbocharger. So, and once you put a turbocharger on an engine, um, less cylinders actually helps you. It, it spools the turbo up faster. Um, it's all about the turbo and how well the turbo is integrated to the engine. So you can see really large torque. And just to put that into perspective, never shared this with anybody else outside of GM. I threw on here the 2006 big block L18. So um, that is an 8.1 liter V8 for those of you that don't know, um, obviously naturally aspirated. And here's the, you know, no replacement for displacement uh, down low. The turbo is just getting up and going. You can see that on both the diesel, which has a turbo as well as the 2.7. It takes a little bit of RPM for that turbo to get, get on full song, if you will. 
um, where the naturally aspirated engine can make more torque down low. But what is super impressive is the at 3000 RPM, the two engines are really close. And then uh, the turbo engine actually hangs on longer than the big block. Um, the big block was kind of all done around 5,000 RPM. And um, the 27 has a little bit more breath out, out to 5,600. So I thought this is a really cool plot. It just shows what we're doing. Um, you know, the, the, the L18, the 8.1 liter was designed uh, 25 ish years ago, 20, you know, 20 years ago, our, our engine has been out in the field for uh, roughly five years. So roughly a 20 year Delta in engine design. Um, and that's, that's what you see. So um, I think it's super impressive. And, uh, and I think that's why there was a lot of comments and you spent a lot of time in the truck, a lot of comments about this thing doesn't feel like it makes 300 horse. It feels like it makes way more. And it's because if it, it drives like a really big engine. Um, down where you drive the truck in the 2000 to 3500, 4000 RPM range. And that's a really, that is a really interesting chart. And I think that really speaks to how far engines have come, right? Engine development has come. Yep. And uh, it, it is, you know, it's interesting. The comments I've been getting on the channel are, oh, it's a four banger. Oh, it's a four banger. I'm like, no, the first sentence of that is turbo. Turbo seems like it makes all the difference. Four banger, like get out of four banger in 1989 Chevy Cavalier. That's a whole yep. different animal we're talking about today. Yep. It's a turbo engine, right? It's a, it's a 300 horsepower turbo engine. And the turbo is really unique in the fact that we focused the turbo on uh, low end torque and, and low lag. And I think that was noticed by many people um, drive, driving the truck. So. Yeah. There, there's really yep. no turbo lag in it at all. And, a lot of conversations about whether it needs more gears, but it performed fine. Eight, eight seemed like it was plenty. So this truck people really loved, right? If you go back to a big block truck, uh, four speed and, uh, and a 411 gear, believe it or not, with our eight gears and the really low um, first gear, we're able to produce in, in the Silverado, we're able to produce more axle torque in first gear with a 2.7 than a big block with a, with a four speed and a 411. So um, just a cool little tidbit, and it's it's why um, these trucks are able to do what they can do, right? In a full size truck, ninety five hundred pounds of towing, in the mid size truck, it's obviously just a, it's a smaller truck, um, seventy seven hundred pounds. So they they tow really really well. So I, way I better than the V six. Right, I think that's the biggest thing for people is is trying to wrap their heads around having a four cylinder in a big truck or a Colorado, and it's like this is not the same four to six to eight argument we had 20 years ago. This is a whole different Correct. argument. Yeah, that was really a displacement argument back then, right? And there was no replacement for displacement. But um, once you bring a turbo into the equation, it can be a replacement for displacement. And then you get all the other benefits of better emissions, better fuel economy, um, you know, lower lower fuel consumption um, is probably the better way to put it at, at a given horsepower. Um, right. So, yeah. I think that's something people don't always recognizes that there's emissions, which is the, the CO2 emissions and its fuel economy. Fuel economy is more cafe. There's emissions over here. So even if you don't really improve your fuel economy, if you, if you decrease emissions quite a bit, you've made a lot of gains. Correct. And, you know, so we could have made the same power and torque uh, as the V6 um, with a, with an even smaller turbo engine, but we didn't want to do that. We wanted to meet future emissions for these trucks and provide the customer with a lot more driving experience. And, and you can clearly see that between uh, the blue line and the yellow line. It, it just drives so much better and it tows so much better. So hmm. um, I think we're offering a lot to our, to our end customers. So, and speaking of the big block, this gets my second question, you know, cause it used to be, yeah, they're really sturdy, you know, steel block or iron block, whatever the deal was, and it was going to last forever and reliable. Yeah. But this two seven is now an aluminum block, and I was yeah. doing a little research on this, and there was a lot of like, oh my god, aluminum blocks are terrible, and it's just awful. These things, whatever. And it seems like aluminum's changed over the years. Is that kind of a way to say it? Yeah. And so um, I guess the metal really, hasn't changed. Um, how we do it. <laughs> Um, I would say aluminum, uh, the, the alloys that we use are different now, right? Everything um, is, is modernized. So I got a slide for that and I'll, I'll walk you through it. But I read a lot of those comments and some of those comments um, go back roughly 50 years to the Chevy Monza. Um, and I'll start off with in this slide here, I'll kind of walk, walk you through everything. But um, in some of the applications that we had four cylinder engines, they were, they were lower outputs. Um, they did not use 
iron liners. So we actually tried to run the, the piston right on the aluminum in the, in the case of the Monza. Um, it worked really well until the engine got overheated once and, um, and then it, it, it didn't work. Um, in the case of the 27, we have a cast in place iron liner. It is the best cast iron that you can make. Um, it, is, it is cast in a, in a spun cast process. And then you can see on the outside of it, it's, we call it spiny lock. So the outside's very rough. And when this gets cast in place, so literally they put four liners in the, in the die cast casting machine. We make this block in, in Bedford, Indiana. I think you're, you're fairly close to, uh, to Bedford, Indiana, um, <clears throat> at our, at our plant in Bedford, Bedford, Indiana. Um, the liners go into the, into the mold and then the mold, um, compresses that aluminum and shoots it into the, into the mold at thousands of, of pounds per square inch. And what you end up with, this is sort of a zoomed in version here is the liner um, and the aluminum effectively make a mechanical bond. And this liner is never coming out of this block. Uh, you'd have to machine away the, the whole iron liner as well as some of the aluminum to get this out of the block, but no need to ever really take it out of the block. Um, we, it's super hard. Um, when you were out in, in San Diego, you got to see the block that had run full validation, uh, virtually nowhere. We never see anywhere with our ring pack combination, our hone and this iron material. Um, the wear is just, it's outstanding at end of life. So, uh, that's one aspect of it. The other aspect that has changed, uh, for, from, you know, 50 years ago, um, is the advent of, of computer design. So uh, what I've got here is a couple pictures that show how we optimize so that the heat, that's one of the big things when, you, when you're making the power density that this engine makes, you have to manage the heat. And the hottest spot of the block, this is a plot of the metal temperatures in the block. The hottest spot of the block is the interbores between the cylinders. And it makes sense. Uh, there's no water that's, that's in there. Um, so, you know, the outside of the, of the bores you can see are quite a bit cooler and it's because the water is going around and touching that part of the bore, but on the inside, not as much. What we've done, um, in this, and I think you might ask the question, um, in San Diego, what's this plastic part that's, that's hanging here, uh, next to the engine. And, and what this is, is a diverter that goes in the block and the water flows up to the diverter and then it feeds in underneath the diverter and up the inner bore. So in three locations, we feed our water up these three inner bores, and it's all about trying to cool those inner bores and manage that temperature the best we can. And then it traverses around. It stays fairly high along the bore because the high, the hottest spot um, otherwise from the inner bores is, is the top of the bore. That's where a lot of the combustion is, is happening. So tons of work to make this all work um, in, in our engine. And I think this is a big difference from engines that were designed in the 50s and the 60s, they didn't have these tools. So you couldn't do a hundred iterations. Um, it, it was all cut and try back then. So you would, you know, you'd make an engine block and then you'd build the engine, you'd run it. Um, if it broke, you'd try to figure out why and you'd try to make changes to, to tooling. Um, we're just able to iterate on things so fast now uh, in the computers and our correlation to the real world uh, uh, after using these computer programs for over 20 years especially doing engine blocks and heads, our correlation is second to none. So um, we still do cut and try, um, but only, only a couple are needed. And it's basically to validate the computer models um, that everything, everything works right. Hmm. Another thing that's unique about our engine block is um, we've got this lower structure. We call it a, a lower crankcase extension. It's really, I, I spent a lot of time in, in racing and built a lot of race engines. It's effectively a girdle or a ladder. Um, so it, it basically ties the main caps and the block structure all together on the bottom. Um, we got forged uh, steel main caps, so another sort of racer trick. Um, and what's cool about a, an inline engine is all the loads are basically straight up and down. In a V engine, um, you have the cylinders kind of going back and forth. So the loads that go into the main caps, there's, there's a, thr a, a force sideways. In an inline engine, especially this engine, engine, we were able to offset the bores from the crank a little bit to even further resolve the loads so that 
the loads are very vertical. And I think when you were there in San Diego, I showed you um, the, the main bearings that had run full life. Uh, at the end of their life, there's still um, our manufacturing um, 2D matrix that's in, in them um, that's like painted in. And it's because the, the load is just so up and down um, and, and it just helps us resolve that load in the block. So um, the last thing that I've got here is we did make some changes going from model year 19. So this engine, I said before, it's been in production going on five years now um, in 22 and a half model year into the Silverado and then 23, obviously going into the Colorado and canyons. Um, we have added a whole kilogram of aluminum to the block. And that was to, to help with the increased loads for the high output, right? We went from 348 pound feet up to 430. Um, so this was one of the tricks we did along with uh, stiffing up the crankshaft. We had to change a piston, a couple other odds and ends, but this is not your granddaddy's aluminum block. And uh, there's actually very few iron block engines out in the light duty space at this point. Most everything is an aluminum block. So we've got a lot of experience with aluminum blocks and aluminum heads. Um, and yeah, it performs really well for us. Great question. And I was watching, uh, I was watching TFL, uh, was TFL now, Andre and you guys did a video. Uh, to comp it's deep dive, more deep dive I'm getting to in this video as far as specifics in the engine. But you talked in that video about you had an electronic water pump as well that helped circulate that water more effectively when it's hot or when it's cold to get the water yep. in the cabinet easier or to cool off and towing, right? Yep, it's really neat. So traditionally, engines had a mechanical pump, you know, driven off of off of a fan belt, if you will, or front accessory drive, we call it. And it's tied to the engine speed. So um, the, I think the best example that uh, resonates with people is if you're towing a trailer, uh, your engine block, your cylinder head, and your turbocharger, in our case, is right at max temperature. It's what it's what everything is designed for. So kind of like uh, this picture here. So you're coming up a hill and um, you at the top of the hill, there's a stoplight and you stop. On a traditional engine, um, the engine comes back to an idle. And what's, what's needed is the coolant flow from, from max power. Um, so what we're able to do with the electric water pump is the engine comes back to an idle and the water pump can stay at basically 6,000 RPM. Uh, that's, the, that's the peak speed in the, in the water pump and just continue to flow max. So it eliminates the, the boiling that you would get under those conditions and really helps this engine and makes the aluminum really happy. So uh, we section our engines after, after every test um, and look for erosion and things like that. It's, this has been one of our best performing engines be, because of that little detail. Yeah, and that was my other question. I kind of answered it, but you know, a lot of people do get concerned. You know, there used to be this mantra, especially for heavy duty diesels as well, saying that if you towed, you had to park and let it sit for indefinite time period to things cool off. I know some of the heavy duty diesels now have a screen that they actually will either alert you or the engine won't actually turn off till it's cooled down. So, in the case of this 27, I mean, what if a consumer is concerned about this? Will the truck still run it? for a little while if they get out of it to cool itself off yeah. there's a message i think it brings me to my next slide here so let me uh let's see yep okay so that revolves around turbochargers so if we go back to when turbochargers first started to go on engines the turbo only was oil fed and oil cooled so every turbo needs oil um there's no getting around that what has changed in I would say mm, the last 20 years um, is, and it's it's been slow, but obviously all, all modern turbos now have coolant feeding to them. And um, in our case, we've got priority coolant feed. So you can see the coolant comes uh, effectively right off the pump. This is the, this is the electric water pump that's here. So the coolant comes right off the pump. It goes through the turbine housing, which houses the bearing. Um, a turbo is actually a very simple device. It's effectively, um, it's got a wheel on one side, uh, looks like a, a jet turbine wheel or a paddle wheel, if you want to even simplify it further, uh, that the exhaust energy turns and then it turns a shaft that goes through just a simple shaft with, uh, with two bearings on both sides and a thrust bearing. And then on the opposite side, there's a, this is the cold side. Um, there's another wheel that takes and sucks in the air and compresses it and, and sends it out to uh, to an intercooler in our case. And I think I've got a picture of that coming up as well. 
well. But um, the key to keeping the turbo happy is it wants it wants fresh, clean oil, nice, cool, fresh, clean oil. And what we've done in this is this engine wasn't ever thought of as an engine without a turbo. We designed this engine right from the onset as a truck engine. Um, it was going to go in a full-size truck. We knew that. It was going to go in a mid-size truck. We knew it. We knew the duty cycle on it, and it was going to have a turbo. So we literally designed the engine around the turbocharger. Um, a little different than in the past, uh, and I feel like where gas engines with turbos had gotten a bad rap is it was a naturally aspirated engine that somebody said, hey, let's make some performance and and throw a turbo on it. And, and that works, um, but then you end up with things that aren't quite as robust. So um, in our case, we knew we needed to get clean, fresh oil to the turbo. Um, it was paramount. You can see here's the oil filter. It is literally the first thing fed off the uh, off the oil cooler, or uh, sorry, off the um, oil filter, right to the turbine bearing housing, um, and then the drain back is is here. And then same thing with the water. We feed the water in, and it goes up. What's cool about the arrangement here is um, we get natural thermal siphoning, so it just heat, you know, hot water wants to rise, and in this case, the cold water comes in. It gets heated up and then it's sort of like a chimney in your house. Um, it goes up and it goes off to the surge tank. So um, that works, I would say, 99% of the time. And then um, there is, I would call it extreme, extreme conditions where we can we can turn on the pump um, and, and after run the pump if needed. So again, the engine's off, but the pump can come on. Uh, the whole system is really smart and and protects the engine and all the components. So another unique thing with the electric water pump. Yeah, so I mean, from a user standpoint or owner standpoint, you're not gonna have the concern about getting it too hot. You just park it, it'll take care of itself. So we <laughs> we uh, we test for this. Um, yes, basically you can run this thing as hard as you possibly uh, can and then pull into a rest stop and shut the truck off. It's good. Okay, yeah, so I, yeah, I know your durability testing. You were talking about how extreme you put through this engines, and I'm like, wow, uh, yeah. So whatever you could do for an owner, they've already done it. Trust me. <laughs> yes. Uh, let's talk about let's talk about fuel type. So uh, I, I was reading some stuff back and forth online. You talked to Andre about this 87 octane, but there's still a lot of people that believe that turbos must have premium fuel. Um, it's another great question. Um, so our engine, the way that we have it calibrated. It runs best on 87 octane, uh, E0 to E15. And um, could we make more power if we put premium fuel and calibrated for it? It could. So people that are saying that turbo engines do respond well to premium fuel, um, it's actually what we do. Uh, we have an application, a performance application in the CT4, and that's a premium required application, and it does make a little more power. Um, that's how we made that power. Uh, was by use of premium fuel. But in the trucks, we know that 99% of our customers want to run regular fuel. And in in the case, if you buy one of our trucks with a 2.7 liter, if you spend and spend the money on premium fuel, you're just wasting your money. So it's designed and, and has been tested and perfectly calibrated to run on 87 octane under all conditions. Hmm. Waste your money. See, that's it. Perfect answer. I can I can do that answer. Building up the I fuel would, question. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, may, I might be going where you're gonna gonna go. I would say um, we do recommend tier tier one based fuel. So um, I would say is spend that, the money on better, tier? better. Yeah, well, I'm not gonna give you any any names, but you know, big names are typically tier one fuel. Um, so actually, uh, even some of the bigger uh, you know bigger stores that that you can buy uh, your food and things at. Uh, sell really, really good quality fuel, fuel. So that's that's all we recommend is good quality fuel with good detergents in it. Um, really, any of the big big names have that. So tier, tier one based fuel. Yeah, it, it's easy to find a uh, top tier gasoline. He's yep. referring to the video I did yesterday. I'm sure he saw. All right. So moving along to a uh, fuel question, thinner weight oils. This comes up all the time in, in some of the comments. You know, we're going this, where we're go, what is it, OWs now and uh, OW10. I mean, we're going to start doing like, I'm going to put like negative five, negative seven these engines after a while. Like, what, what's the deal with these, this thin weight of oil? I mean, you're looking at this stuff on his fingers. You can, you can, it's like, you can look, through your, look through the oil completely. 
It's like kerosene, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> or water. Yeah, so um, I, I put together a slide for that. And uh, and basically what it comes down to, you know, why is the industry doing that? It's all about friction. Um, this particular engine, uh, I guess a little tidbit, we, we architected the engine to run on 020. Um, you know, GM's not... Not um, <laughs> we know what we're doing with putting a 2.7 liter into full size trucks. So um, one of the things we did to just increase the robustness, everything we do, and I think that's the mantra that I've been trying to trying to get across here. We have held out nowhere um, to ensure that this engine is extremely durable. And for our case, uh, we recommend 530, but the engine was actually architected for 020. Um, so it just provides a little bit more. Um, a little bit more resistance, um, you know, a little, little better uh, capability for, for the bearings. But um, new engines, the way that we architect the engine, uh, we go in knowing the loads and then we size the bearings for the oil. So it's basically the projected load. Uh, think of surface area, if you will, um, and how, how big that surface area is on the bearing. So something we pick right right up front, um, and then we typically don't change oils. You know, you don't see GM um, changing changing an engine from a, a you know a, a 540 to a to a 020. It's just not something we would do within an architecture without you know significant changes. Mm, that makes sense. Uh, one so one last question. Ones I sent you, and I got two little fast ones. But uh, I always hear turbos need clean cold air they lo love to run hot but they need cold air because it's more condensed to feed it and i didn't see anything in the press release whatever about this engine about airflow coming in have you made some changes to how much air is coming in the engine or into the turbo um maybe? yeah no so turbo engines do require nice cool air um but probably more on the on the intercooler side than necessarily what's coming into the compressor um, but yeah. what I've got here is a picture of the whole airflow system that's in the Colorado. You can see we've got a, a nice big air box um, with very low restriction. Uh, the turbocharger does like low restriction on the inlet side of the compressor. So super low restriction going through. Um, there's a there's a resonator in here and some noise reduction in this box and then straight into the into the compressor. There's a snorkel that's not on here, but um, we basically pull air right in front of the the radiator that's not shown here. And then um, the compressor compresses the air as any with any compressor. It heats the air up doing that. It's just physics. So then we go through an intercooler. Um, the intercooler on the uh, on the Colorado is actually nice and nice and big. It's uh, the same center section that's in the Silverado and Sierra. So nice, nice and big. Uh, the end tanks are a little different on the on the Colorado, and then it goes up into the engine. So engines don't like hot air. Um, the engine always will be happiest with uh, with cool air, especially a turbocharged engine. So um, so that's where we really focused on making the intercooler very efficient. Hmm. Yeah, makes sense. All right, last two lightning round, lightning round. Yep. Uh, we discussed uh, cylinder deactivation on the four cylinder. You. you and the press release says it's active fuel management, not dynamic fuel management. I give myself some props because I know the words behind those, those letters, the acronyms. I get I know what they are. So why do we do active fuel management on a four cylinder? It, it just comes down to um, uh, efficiency and, and fuel consumption. Um, turning off cylinders, so active fuel management or DFM, there is no better way from an engine perspective um, to, to save fuel. So uh, the system is extremely seamless on the Colorado, and it, you know it's been in the in the Silverado and Sierra as well. Um, the the customer shouldn't know that it's on. We do in the in the Colorado. If you look at your instantaneous fuel economy um, on the either on the center screen or even uh, in the DIC, you can you can move it over to the DIC in the application. It does say Eco. There's a there's a little green uh, icon that comes up when the engine's in two cylinder mode and it's, it's just under light loads. Uh, we turn off two cylinders and then you run those other two cylinders a little, a little harder, a little more efficient. Um, it reduces uh, thermal losses and it, it works really, really well. So. Okay. And, and one final question, we talked a little bit off, off mm -hmm. about this, but the oil pan uh, there's been a lot of conversations lately because I think you guys did it. And I think Ford did as well. They made a plastic oil pan 
which uh, it's not it's not this cup it's not this thin plastic but people see plastic and like oh my god it's cheap chinese plastic all that kind of stuff so but you, you you told me you're having there's a little change here with this engine yeah so uh up to this point the the engine has had a plastic oil pan um we we're increasing the engine's capacity to to, to be able to supply um, and, and meet the demand for the Colorado and Canyon. And in doing that, uh, we had to reassess um, how much tooling, basically every part on the engine, um, you know, every part's basically being doubled in, in capacity. So the, the tooling on the plastic oil pan, um, we were gonna have to go and buy um, all new plastic oil pans, uh, more, more tooling for it, and we decided it was actually a better um, a better idea for us to tool up an aluminum oil pan. So it's a stamped aluminum oil pan, very similar to what the LM2 and LZ0 have been in production with. Uh, it was a, our first application to use uh, that technology, and it works really well on, on this application. So we're transitioning to that um, over the next year. Uh, it's going to take some time for all of our applications to, to move over to that. But um, yeah, it's something our team's pretty excited about. Um, we think, we think, uh, the customers will, will appreciate that. So, you know, I, and I do appreciate your team getting excited about an oil pan material. <laughs> you can tell we get excited about pretty much everything. So this, this engine is a pretty exciting engine just for our team and, uh, the output that it can provide, you know, here's a, uh, you know, little, little 2.7 liter four cylinder and we're banging on the door of a, of a big block Chevy. So, um, from an output perspective, so. Pretty exciting. It's a it's a super fun program, and uh, it it exceeds our expectations and our customers that buy it. Uh, we want to exceed their expectations. Wow, very cool. I really appreciate being on today. Yep, thank you. Appreciate the invite. All right, hey, check out other videos over here. Website down below as well. Pickuptrucktalk.com. I made it hard to say, but easy to type into your web browser. Pickuptrucktalk.com. Three words. Uh, as always, thanks for watching. We will see you down the road.